This is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. Welcome this morning to uh, Christ Memorial Lutheran Church. We're blessed you're all here, especially blessed that the uh, visitors, and both online and in person, have joined us this morning to celebrate Jesus Christ, our Savior. We'll be celebrating Holy Communion later on this morning, and if you're visiting with us this morning, we have a statement of our beliefs on the front of the worship folder. If you concur with our beliefs or agree with our beliefs, please join us at the Lord's table later in, later in the worship service. We also ask for everybody to please complete a, a, a visitor's card, or either a visitor's card or a, or a tenant's card, which is in the pew back uh, in front of you on, in, the, in the pew here, and uh, place it in the offering plate later in the worship service. Uh, we'll be have, having an Advent service on Wednesday, and we'll have lunch at 11.30, and the worship service will be at 12.15 in the fellowship hall. Also, will be a voters' assembly meeting today at 12, at 12 o'clock here in the sanctuary. Uh, it'll be a short meeting, uh, just a brief update on, that, on our budget, as well as activities going on early in the new year. So please join us uh, for the voters' assembly meeting. Also, there's an opportunity to sign up for the uh, poinsettias that you see here on, on, our, on, the, on the altar. Uh, it's, uh, the information is found in our worship folder. Anything else I've missed? Just checking. Thank you. Um, at this time, we'll turn it over to the pastor, Pastor Tyler, for his comments. All right. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is good to see you again. Special welcome to those of you joining online. If you're joining us live via Facebook, make sure you share that feed. Uh, those of you here in the room, that's an easy way to invite people to church, by the way, is to just send them a link to either the feed on Sunday morning or the feed afterwards. We have our service, the entire service on Facebook as well as YouTube. So that's a great way to invite people to church. Another way to invite people to church is to invite them to church, uh, is to grab this one of these postcards or a couple of these postcards after the service. They're on our, the black table there on the right-hand side that says welcome on it real big. Um, we have plenty of them, so grab them, take them, give them to people. Uh, it advertises our Christmas Eve services, uh, which are at 4 o'clock and 6 o'clock. 4 o'clock is going to be our Rejoice service, a little more contemporary. And then 6 o'clock is going to be our Reflect service. We call it, we're calling it Classical Christmas. It's a little more traditional. Um, and so those two different styles should, should meet our kind of varying uh, population and our varying needs that we have on Christmas. So invite people to Christmas. This is when folks are willing to come to church. Uh, also, I just want to say Mark mentioned our um, our Advent service this past week. We got a little sneak preview of the kids program during our Advent service, and it was a blast. It was so much fun. We had 125 people here for that. So that's just an amazing, amazing thing, something that we can rejoice that we are so blessed uh, with that partnership as we work alongside the school and ministry. With that being said, I'm going to invite you guys to go ahead and stand as we begin today with our opening hymn, my personal favorite Advent slash Christmas hymn, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel.
We do rejoice on this Godet Sunday, which is the Sunday of joy. We have our pink candle lit. That's why I have the purple on today. I didn't just mismatch my colors, I promise. Uh, but we do celebrate joy as we go through Advent today. We call upon the presence of God in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered together to hear God's word, to call upon him in prayer and praise, and to receive the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. We pause for a moment of private prayer and confession. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you. And for his sake forgives you all of your sins as a called and ordained servant of Christ. And by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We now read responsively Psalm 85, read responsibly by verse. Psalm 85. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath. You turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God, of our salvation, and put away your indignation toward us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints, but let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground and righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we implore you to hear our prayers, enlighten the darkness of our hearts by your gracious visitation. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading this morning from the Old Testament is from the prophet Amos chapter 9, verses 11 to 15, and can be found on page 771 of your Pew Bible, if you wish to follow. In that day, I will raise up the booth of David that is fallen, and repair its breaches, and raise up its ruins, and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Egypt, of Edom, and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. 
I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land, and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> the epistle is from the first letter of Peter, chapter 2, the first 10 verses, and you may find this on page 1014 of your pew Bible. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor for you who believe, the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become a cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand. Our gospel reading today comes to us from Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 18. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Then Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We now profess our faith together through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as we continue in worship with our hymn, Lo, How a Rose Air Blooming.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, I got to tell you, there's something about building something with your hands, isn't there? Getting in there and finding when something's broken and being able to take it apart and figure out how it works and, and putting it together and fixing it and knowing, like, I did that. And because I fixed it, it's fixed right and it's fixed proper. There's something about doing those things with your hands that I just cannot do. <laughs> that is not my strength and gift in life. Uh, when something is broken and I try and fix it, my wife is actually behind me calling somebody to fix what I have fixed. That is the way things work. And I, I, I hesitate to admit this because I know that there are a good number of folks here who are quite handy, um, but there have not once but twice in my life something has gone wrong in the engine of my car and my solution is to sell it and buy a new one. True story. <laughs> That is, I have done that. Um, now they are big things, but nonetheless. Um, and, and I find myself being jealous of those who can just look at something and just fix it. Like I watch Barry around here and he just kind of looks at something and figures it out. And, and that's amazing to me. And my hope is in the midst of today's sermon that you guys are not like me. Uh, as we're going to be talking about the idea of rebuilding. Uh, not literal rebuilding, but more metaphorical rebuilding, the rebuilding of our spirit, the rebuilding of ourselves, the rebuilding of our church. And my hope is that we can see value in, in rolling up our sleeves and getting in there and fixing something and doing it properly. But before I go into that, if you could join me in prayer. <sighs> Lord God, Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for today for this chance that we get to come together, whether here in this room or those watching online across the world throughout various times, Lord, we thank you. Lord, I thank you for the chance to share your message to all those people because, Lord, it is your message. It's not about me or from me. I trust in you. I submit myself to you, and I pray that all who hear this will be willing to do the same, to submit themselves to you because your Holy Spirit is real and powerful and can work in great ways. And so I pray that your Holy Spirit is at work through these words, proclaim your truth and your love. In your name we pray, amen. Again, a special welcome to those of you joining online. If you hear a sermon uh, that you're like, man, this would be really good for this person, and quite frankly, this series that we're going through, uh, I have in mind those who have kind of wandered away from the church. So perhaps you know somebody like that that you would want to share, like, hey, these, these messages would really speak to those people. You can do that, again, via Facebook, via YouTube, via our website. There's an audio-only version on there as well. Well, we are in the midst of this sermon series that we're calling Rediscover Christmas, uh, really going through using these re-words. Last week, we talked about repenting. Not that like condemning voice that you hear on the sidewalk through a bullhorn, but instead the idea of examining ourselves. Uh, we use the metaphor of being on a highway and realizing you're going the wrong direction, away from God, away from the desire of God, the way this world is supposed to go. And you're cruising along, and it's not enough to just say, whoop, I'm going the wrong direction. No, we have to actively exit and U-turn and go back the way that we should be going, right? And since we took that time to examine ourselves and find perhaps what is broken, find those, those flaws that needs fixing, today we're talking about that action, rebuilding, that process of rebuilding. And I gotta tell you, sometimes it's more work than you thought. Sometimes it's more involved to fix something than perhaps you initially had an idea. I found this out this week, as a matter of fact. Uh, on Tuesday, I was on my way to an evening meeting, and my wife calls, and she says, hey, we, there might be a problem. And I said, okay. She said, well, there's this, this large stain on the ceiling, like a, like a dark stain. That, it looks like water, but, but it doesn't make sense it'd be water because it hasn't rained, and it's on the first floor. And I said, oh, that's a big problem. Okay. Um, so sure enough, we got a plumber out and there was a water supply line that had a crack in it and was actively letting loose the water that it had inside of it. Uh, so in order for the person to identify and fix this problem, they had to cut open the ceiling, right, and, and find the pipe, and then they had to cut a bigger hole in the ceiling to get their tools in there to fix the problem. They finally fixed it and, and patched it up. It's not leaking anymore, but now we got a big old hole in our ceiling and the temptation would be, well, just call somebody who can do some, some sheetrock and they, you know, drywall that puppy back up and you're good to go. But, but I know 
that that wouldn't actually, that might cause more problems, right? If I just fix the hole that is visible that I can see, because there was water spewing, and so there's potentially, you know, wet drywall and mold and all that kind of stuff. So sometimes, in order to fix the problem, you first have to deconstruct. You first have to go through a little bit of demolition when it comes to fixing a problem in your life. Maybe you identify, yep, there is a, a, an unsightly uh, stain on my ceiling. There's something in my life as you're going through that series, that process of repenting, you recognize that there's a problem, something that needs fixing. And sometimes in order to fix it, you first have to deconstruct a little bit. You first have to, to, to demolish a little bit and kind of peel things away. Think of it like this. Like if, if somebody um, goes and steals food, right? You have to address the fact that they're stealing food. But then if you don't address why they're stealing food, that might be a problem. If you're not asking like, okay, uh, is this a pathological problem? Is, this, is, is there need? Is there hunger? Like if you don't address that problem, it's just going to happen again right? And you're going to have bigger, further issues later on. So you want to deconstruct and demolish a little bit. Sometimes the problem is bigger than you initially thought. Now, already uh, in the past couple minutes, I have said a word multiple times that perhaps not in this circle, not in really the Lutheran church, but in other parts of Christianity, there would be people cringing in the pews right now. The word deconstruct. It's a hot button issue in evangelical American Christianity, this idea of deconstruction, because basically what it is, it's a shorthand term um, that has become popular really over the past decade or so, uh, of taking your faith, taking your, your understanding of Christianity, of the church, and deconstructing it, taking it apart board by board and looking for flaws, looking for issues, looking for things that, that have perhaps gone astray, that need fixing, right? Uh, the, the proverbial rotten board in the midst of the shelter, the dwelling, the home, right? And so as you deconstruct, as you tear it apart, it's this idea of kind of questioning your faith. And it's a process that people go through. And again, it's become shorthand, and, and many um, popular, famous Christians have, have gone through this process. Now, that sounds like, okay, that, that sounds reasonable to, to find the issues, to find the things that have gone wrong within, within your faith, the things perhaps that you've held on to that aren't really about Christ, about Christianity, uh, and say, okay, we're just going to remove that, right? The trouble is, what tends to happen is, as people go through this long period of deconstruction, they leave the faith. They leave the church entirely. They just walk away. Because it's like this. If you have a house and you begin deconstructing it because you have a problem, you have some sort of issue, you know, the, the, the metaphorical leaky pipe, and you're trying to find, you know, where all did that water go that corrupted this home, that's causing mold, that's causing rot, that's causing these issues, and you start to take it apart, and you, you find the problem, and you go, okay, great, and, and you got down, you found what is good, and you found what is bad, and you discard what is bad, and you're left with what is good, and you're left with a firm foundation, Right? We see that in our epistle reading today. The foundation of our faith, the foundation of the church is Christ. And it is a true and perfect foundation. And, and truly, there are good bits within the church, within faith, and, and people who go through this process will admit that. The issue is, though, they're suddenly looking and seeing a whole mess on their hands. And the process of rebuilding is strenuous and messy. It requires a lot of work, a lot of prayer, a lot of reading, a lot of, a lot of time spent communicating with God and trying to figure out how do we do this? Because the reality is you're left with the perfect foundation, but you can't live on a foundation. You can't live on a concrete slab, no matter how perfect it is. Eventually, you have to have a roof over your head when the storms come, and the storms will come. And that's the beauty of the church, of the community that we have, is that we provide sanctuary, truly, from the storms of this world, from the difficulties that people will experience. And what's happening is people are looking at this mess after they deconstruct, after they take out all the rotten boards that, that haven't been addressed over generations, and they are left with some pile of wood over here and a firm foundation, and they say, rather than taking the time to rebuild... Rather than taking the time to reconstruct and make this something that is good and trustworthy, they instead walk away. And they look for an easier, 
more simple solution. They, they go to the tents and the shacks and the lean-tos, and those are all temporary solutions to a permanent problem. The question of where do we find hope? The question of what do we cling to in the midst of those storms? What do we have that can keep us safe? And we have an entire generation that has ended up homeless because they've gone through this process of looking at the church and, and saying, well, this isn't necessarily the place for me, right? I, I just saw um, that, that young people in particular, I talked about this a little bit last week, young people generally are just hesitant towards whatever institutions their parents belong to, right? That's just a, a general thing, and that's been true not just this generation, but generations past and past and past. Um, and that's certainly true now. And so when, when you are in church and your kid sees you in church, they're going to be skeptical walking in. And so they're going to go through this process of questioning, of, of doubting, of being a skeptic. And that's okay because God can stand up to that. But what I always told my middle schoolers is it's fine to ask questions as long as you stick around to hear the answers. Because so often they'd ask this big, deep question. They're like, see, I got you. You didn't think about that. I'm like, actually, I, and then they're gone. I'm like, oh, well, well I had an answer. <laughs> I've thought about that because I was your age too once. And perhaps the answer, perhaps the solution is something that's outside of this structure that we've built. This thing that we've become familiar with and defined as church. Because while the foundation is pure, while the foundation is true, whatever structure goes on top of that, that can change. That can evolve. That, that doesn't need to be cookie cutter in the same for everyone. But you have to take the time to rebuild. And so we have an entire generation that is homeless and is going from tent to tent to shack to lean to, and they're finding temporary solutions to this permanent problem. Last week I talked about how, how oftentimes, especially right now, young people find purpose, find hope, find meaning, find even spirituality in all sorts of things of this world, whether it be nature or music, or books, or fiction, or certain personalities on TikTok, right? I said that almost exact phrase last week, but it's true. And that's where they're looking for meaning. That's where they're looking for understanding, because they look at the church as it has built up, and they see a place that has significant flaws that are not being addressed, that are being ignored. And here's the thing. This crisis of a homeless generation of young people who aren't in church, we can't ignore that because it's only going to get worse. It's just like that stain on the ceiling in my house. I could say, well, that's, that could be a problem, but you know, it's probably fine. And just ignore it. What's going to happen? It's going to grow. It's going to get worse. And eventually the house is going to be condemned and unlivable. In the church, we have a crisis we have a crisis of young people who aren't finding their way here, and we need to figure out what we need to do to address that. What we, we don't have the luxury of ignoring that. So, as we examine the church, as we examine ourselves as Christians, as we examine what we think it means to be a Christian, let us uh, find where that foundation is, because the foundation that we have is pure and true. See, that's the funny thing. When it comes to Jesus, especially the teachings of Jesus, the world's pretty much okay with it. The teachings of love and compassion, the teachings of sharing with those who are poor, who need help, the teachings of loving the sinner even while you admonish the sin, those teachings, by and large, people are like, yeah, that, okay. There are other religions that hold Jesus as a great teacher, so if the foundation is solid and pretty much everybody's kind of on board with that idea of loving one another, why do we have such an issue? Well, it's because of the structure that we have built up on top of that foundation, but we know that you can't just live on the concrete slab. So this is about rediscovering Christmas, right? As we seek to rediscover Christmas, as we seek to go through this, this Advent, preparing ourselves for the coming Christ for Christmas, may we focus our eyes at first on the foundation, on the memory that, that despite all the amazing things that happen around Christmas time, all the lights and the songs and the food and the family coming together, all those things are great, but it comes down to a baby in a barn. 
It's all about a God who looked at this world, he saw as it was broken, he decided to do something about it. And praise God, his solution wasn't, let's sell it and buy a new one. (laughs) His solution was, I'm going to fix it and I'm going to fix it right. He came to this earth as a baby. He lived a perfect life. And yet still, because we're so broken, we still killed him. But he knew that that death would set us free. And so as we look at that foundation, maybe remember that that's what it's all about. Now, we have to build a structure. We have traditions, and traditions are good so long as they honor the foundation, so long as they point back to what it's all about. On this Godette Sunday, as we celebrate joy, certainly Christmas lights and songs and and, and food, all that, that brings joy to people, and that's a good thing. That is a good thing. But may we always be focused back on the foundation. Because within the church, we have a permanent solution to the permanent problem. The problem of sin, the problem of depravity of this world, the problem of hurt and brokenness. We can point back to the permanent solution, which is that we are forgiven for eternity through Jesus Christ. So that's kind of the big picture. But what about you? As you examine yourself, as you went through that process, hopefully over the last week of repentance, of examining who you are and and finding those instances of rotten wood. Well, it's a lifelong process of rebuilding, of making yourself better. Now, also recognizing and, quite frankly, teaching that there is no such thing as a perfect house. (laughs) Because just as soon as you fix the squeaky stair, you start to notice the seams in the drywall. You start to notice that light that's out. You start to notice these little things around the house. And yeah, you're, you're constantly fixing them, but another thing's going to pop up. And we just recognize that houses are imperfect. And the church and us, we're imperfect too. I'm reminded of the Walt Disney quote that said, Disneyland is never done. It's never completed. There's constantly work being done on it. There's constantly improvements that are being made. And that is true of the church. That is true of our lives. It's that lifelong process of the pursuit of godliness, to be pleasing to God. But we let ourselves off the hook a little bit because we recognize we're not perfect. And perhaps we need to teach that because you don't just uh, seek perfection in everything you do or else you're going to be moving a lot. If you don't recognize that there is no such thing as the perfect home, you're going to be selling house after house after house. You're going to be going from job to job to job. You're going to be going from church to church to church, from from faith to faith to faith to religion to non-religion and all these things if you're constantly seeking perfection. See, we have a perfect God and an imperfect church. We have a perfect foundation with an imperfect dwelling sitting on top of it. There are humans involved, so it will always be imperfect. But we trust that the foundation is pure and that as we continually seek to make things better, as we continually seek to make our dwelling, our house, our shelter more of a sanctuary, more of a safe place where all are welcome, we know that God is with us, that he won't forsake us, and that he is at work in this world, that he is finding homes for the homeless that he is helping the faithless to find faith, that he is helping those who think that they are hopeless to know the hope that is found in Jesus Christ. So this Christmas, as we rebuild on the foundation, as we've gone through that series, that process of repentance, and we rebuild and say, okay, what is this ultimately about? I pray that we can be a voice for love and hope and compassion, that we can help those who are wandering, lost, and homeless that we can help them to see that there is a home, that there is a sanctuary, that there is a safe place, all through Jesus Christ and all to the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Now, if you'll join me in prayer. Lord God, we come to you today and we recognize that while we stand upon a firm foundation, we can't just stop at the foundation, that, that we do have to build up a dwelling, and we pray that we can make that dwelling as, as God-pleasing as possible. Whether that dwelling be the church, whether that dwelling be our lives, that on this Sunday where we celebrate joy, that we can find joy in you, that we can find joy in the fact that, that our feet are placed upon the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. 
Lord, help us to find our identity in that forgiveness and in that love, to share that forgiveness and that love with so many who are hurting, who need desperately to hear the message of hope. As there is so much darkness and pain, especially this time of year, we pray that you would be able to to break through in a real and powerful way. Lord, help us to be your hands and your feet. Help us to be the ones to break down walls, to, to whether it be we send a link to somebody, inviting them to church, we give them a card, or we just simply live lives that cause people to say, what's the reason for the hope that you have? Lord, help us to point to you. And Lord, we live in a broken world, and because it's broken, there is pain, and we need you to fix us. Because of that brokenness, there are so many who are experiencing pain right now. We pray especially for those who are affected by the storms uh, that swept through this country. So many that, that now find themselves literally homeless. Lord, help them to rebuild. Help those communities to rebuild and to rebuild better, to be re rebuild strong, to rebuild with faith in you. Lord, help us to be present for those who may not be literally homeless, but are spiritually homeless. Help us to point to your sanctuary, that this is a place that is a home for all. Lord, we place our trust and our faith, our hope in you. And Lord, because this world is broken and in pain, there are so many more prayers that I, I can't raise them all up. It's impossible. And yet, as you walked on this earth, you taught us a prayer that speaks to everyone, that speaks to the praises and the joy, and also speaks to the, the tears in the morning. And so, together, as one family of believers sitting in your sanctuary, whether that be here in this room or spread out across the country watching online, Lord, this is your sanctuary within your faith, within your kingdom and so we get to raise up that very same prayer together, unified, with one voice. We pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Those of you joining online, we're going to continue in worship now by gathering uh, our offering, gathering the blessings that God has put into our care that we can then turn back to him. Uh, we can't pass you the plate, but there is our ways to give online. That's true for everybody here in the room as well. I just want to say uh, it does make life a lot easier if you set up online giving recurringly. Uh, it makes life easier on you. And it makes life easier on us as well for the church. So if you ever need help on setting that up, come find me and I'll make that happen for you. Um, but those of you joining online, we thank you so much for joining us. We pray that you, uh, you're blessed and that you're able to bless others, that you can point to others to the sanctuary, to the gift of home that we can have in faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, after the offering, we'll let you guys go. We pray that you have a blessed week. With that being said, we continue now in worship.